Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and I wanted to do a true story episode uh, about something that one of my subscribers had asked me to do. So today we're talking about Slash and Joe Perry's prized 1959 uh, Gibson Les Paul guitar. Now uh, there's a whole backstory to this, there's a couple articles that talk about this and even an interview with Slash where he talks a bit more about it. So according to GuitarPlayer.com, there's an article called How Slash Reunited Joe Perry with a Prized 59 Les Paul. Uh, and basically, the, the article goes, what do Joe Perry, Slash, and Eric Johnson have in common? He's a little fuzzy on the details around when he acquired it and a little fuzzy on the details around when he became separated from it. But Joe Perry knows exactly where his 1959 Les Paul is now. So he thinks he picked it up in a midnight swap and knows it was with him in the studio and on stage throughout the late 70s, but later parted with it around the time of his divorce in 1982. Either way, fellow Boston rocker Billy Lusigan recognized it sitting in the East Coast guitars and picked it up for $4,200 and a Firebird, I, Firebird 1 trade-in. A few years later, Lusigan sold it to a jazz guitarist, Jerry Bedowin, but just a few days after that, he saw the guitar in a guitar show in the hands of Eric Johnson. When Aerosmith got back together for the Back in the Saddle tour, Perry says Johnson contacted him through mutual friends and offered to sell the guitar back to him, but Perry couldn't afford it at that time. By the time Perry could afford it, he lost track of it again. So Perry said, I decided to track it down, so I started to make some calls and some friends started looking for it too, said Perry. I was talking to Bradley Whitford about it, and the next day he walked into the studio and says, I know where your guitar is. He shows me an issue of Guitar Player magazine, and there's a story on Slash's guitars, and right in the middle was a picture of the guitar. His elation of finding it was short-lived when he realized Slash wasn't looking to sell it. Oh man, please don't ask me that, Slash reportedly replied. Perry understood and later said, I mean, if I get the chance to hold that white Strat Jeff Beck played on, uh, wired, I'd have a hard time letting go of it as well. So over the years and gigs together, Perry didn't miss an opportunity to bring it up, but Slash had already made up his mind about the guitar. Now Slash did talk about the guitar in his book and here's what he had to say about it. Now in Slash's 2007 autobiography, he talked about the time he acquired it. So Guns was playing some tour dates in Australia and New Zealand in 1988. And when they got back to the States, he had this to say, When we got back to L.A., I treated myself to a rare indulgence, a guitar. Somehow this collector got in touch with our management because he wanted to sell me Joe Perry's 1959 Les Paul, the tobacco-colored sunburst he'd been photographed with countless times. Joe's ex-wife sold it back when he was still on drugs and they had come upon tough times. And this was it. The guy had pictures of it and all the documentation. I knew that guitar well. Joe was holding it in Aerosmith's poster I had on my wall growing up. It had a distinctive nick in it. This was the real deal. The guy wanted eight grand for it, and though I had never spent eight grand on anything before in my entire life, I had to have it. It was a pretty amazing moment when I finally held that guitar in my hands. The same instrument that played an essential role in the path I'd chosen in life was now in my possession, and I would use it on the November Rain video. I truly felt like I'd arrived. If memory serves, it was around this time that I finally retired to storage the guitar that I'd used on Appetite, my Les Paul replica and the backup for it that I'd bought. I abused my guitars when I played live, and by that point it was severely banged up after all of that touring. It did make a cameo in the Sweet Child of Mine video, however, however as it did in the, page, in the Paradise City video, actually I used it in most of our videos with a few exceptions, one of them being November Rain where I used Joe Perry's 1959 Orange Les Paul. But I was going to I was going to tell a story about this one guitar. <coughs> um, when I was when I was uh, in my you know first stages of uh, learning how to play, uh, there was this live Aerosmith record called Live Bootleg. Oh yeah. One of the best live records ever. I love ever. that record, right. yeah, man. And in the, in the fold-out, this is back when they had vinyl, right? Um, in the fold-out, there was a, a couple pictures of Joe with this uh, tobacco sunburst, uh, Les Paul. So instead of the regular sort of red, yellow, cherry thing, it was more of a black to brown, sort of a puke yellow kind of deal. And uh, I thought that was the coolest, you know, in my sort of discovering Les Paul period, that was the coolest guitar I'd ever seen. So years and years later, um, I got this, I was in Japan and I got this phone call saying that uh, there's some guy trying to sell this guitar that I might be interested in. And it was a, a, a tobacco, 59 tobacco Les Paul. And uh, it was owned by Dwayne, Dwayne Allman and then Joe Perry, right? So I was like, get out of here. So I said, send me, send me uh, the photos. And uh, we were on tour in Japan. So when I got back to LA, I went to my apartment and there was this envelope, you know, 
from whoever, I don't know who it was, I just opened it up sort of nonchalantly and out came these, these uh, you know, what do you call three by fives of, of this guitar. And I, you recognize the guitar because it had, like this was worn off right here and then there was a, a scratch underneath the pick art mm -hmm. right here and a scratch right here and a couple of recognizable things from hours of studying these pictures. I knew exactly <laughs> what this guitar looked like. <clears throat> and uh, I bought the guitar for eight grand. Right. So nobody knew exactly what the value of these things were. So I, I bought the guitar and it uh, showed up at my apartment <laughs> and it, it, there it was. And this is a 59 that's been played by all these great guys. And so it was very, it was sort of a coveted thing for me. You know, I didn't really touch <coughs> it too much until, you know, a few years later and I went into the studio and, and uh, was making a record and I pulled this thing out, which is what happens with vintage guitars. You tend to tuck them away because they <laughs> yeah. are that. Right. Anyway, and I pulled this thing out and, uh, and it sounded, it sounded really good, but it didn't sound like, you know, like anything you'd want to necessarily call, you know, write home about or anything like that. So I, I recorded uh, one song with it and uh, shot one video with it. And then years and years went by and then I finally I gave it back to Joe for his birthday. Nice. Five years ago. So that's like, there's a, a guitar that's got some history and has made some amazing sounds, but right. didn't necessarily it, you know, it, it, it was like, it's a good guitar, but it didn't speak to me in the way that my own guitar did, you know? It wasn't sure. worth having to, uh. to, to keep it around for the sake of keeping it around, you know? And it was too valuable and too, had too much history to start beating it up like I was I had done my own guitar. So it was just going to be collecting dust and only getting picked out for those special moments, which I don't think a, a good guitar should be used for. You know? happy. He was very happy. He was That's very cool, happy. man. Yeah. That's a great story. He was like, "That's the only thing I have from that period." That you know, so it was, it was cool to give it back to him. You, uh, you are unsparing in this book. You talk about the highs, the lows, and uh, what's pretty compelling, which I think most people don't realize, is that Aerosmith. You guys get started. You're one of the biggest rock and roll acts in the '70s, hugely successful, and then you guys all fell on hard times to the point where you were forced to sell your favorite guitar. Now, I'm a guitar buff. It was a 1959 Les Paul. This was a guitar that was your guitar uh, that you used on all these classic songs that everybody here knows, and you had to sell that guitar? Well, it was, uh, let's see, 1980. I, I just left Aerosmith, and it was Christmas time, and I needed some bread. and. Uh, um, actually, I was playing Stratocasters a lot right around then, and uh, that was the best guitar to sell. I could get rid of it pretty quick because right. they are very rare, and like you said, you know uh, the, the value to them. So anyway, I sold it and uh, really didn't think much of it. And you it. probably sold it for not nearly what, it, not a, a fraction of what you would get for it today. Well, let's just say I didn't bid it out, you know. I mean, there was no eBay or anything like that right, back then. Right. I just called up my... Uh, one of my dealer friends, anyway. So, um, time went on, and uh, over the years, uh, the band got back together again, and we started um, starting to uh, have some success again. And I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to, maybe if I, I could find um, some of those old guitars that, that had gone the way of the wind, you know? So, um, I started looking for this one, and I had all my guitar techs out looking everywhere, and Brad walks in and said, I know where your guitar is, and he opens up a guitar magazine, and the centerfold had Slash's guitar collection, and right in the middle was that guitar. So Slash had ended up with your guitar? Yeah, it changed hands, and it ended up in his, his hands, and he's made no bones about the fact that he's been a fan of the band, and uh, boy, when I, when I, he, I called him up and he was like, oh, please don't ask me, man. Don't ask me that, you know, because he did not want to get rid you, of it. Did you man. say I'll buy it back? I, yeah, uh, I said I'll pay you whatever you want for it because it, it had, like, doubled in price by then. And, right. And, uh, and he said, well, listen, I'll think about it. So uh, I called him back and over a series of uh, months go by and I'm talking to him and, you know, every, I'd, I'd ask him, and then finally he stopped taking my calls. And I, I finally had to, 
I had to, I had to sit him down. Slash and say, just put his hat over the phone. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> I, I, don't want, I don't want to hear that anymore, man. And I knew it was getting in the way of our friendship. And I said, look, I'll never ask you about it again, man. I just want, if you ever want to sell it back, just, just, you know, give me a call, whatever. But I'm not going to bug you about it. And uh, at my 50th birthday, um, Cheap Trick was playing. They came in to, to play. And uh, I sat in with them. And in the middle of the set, my guitar tech walks up and hands me this guitar. And it was the guitar. And Slash gave it to me. Slash gave it to you. That is a sweet guy. We have our personal experiences. We've done a lot of bits. I've done a lot of things with Slash, and he is one of the nicest guys you'll ever I'll meet. Tell you, I can't he's believe got, he did that. His heart is so big, I don't know how it fits in his chest. Yeah. I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. That's a scary description. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've got to get Slash some medical attention.